Live, live. I believe I am live. Hey, friends, family. This is David here. I'm coming to you live as I do every Sunday. Today, I have some exciting things that I want to share with you. I just thought I'd be a blessing to you because uh, we had the most amazing time at Elohim Church Global today. Uh, just a great, beautiful presence of God in the house. But I want to share some uh, practical things from the Word of God with you today. This is what we were looking at. We were looking at the second part of the message that we started last week. And last week we were calling the message, You Are Significant. And so today was uh, part two of that message, that you are significant. So we moved on from the message in Kings when we were looking at uh, lessons from Elijah. Today we were looking at a different man from the Bible as a point of focus to glean lessons from. And the man's name was Gideon. And for those of you that know your scriptures, you know that the story of Gideon comes from the book of Judges. And, uh, and in chapter 6, we begin to see his story unfold. As a matter of fact, all three chapters from 6 uh, to 8 talk about the story of Gideon and what he did immediately after Joshua. And uh, I want to share some lessons with you from this man's life that I believe will change your life, that I believe will add value to your life. Seven lessons that I want to share very quickly with you. And so when you begin to read the scriptures, you find that Gideon, in that time, he was living in a time when the Israelites had disobeyed God. They had fallen away from God's blessing and God's favor, and they were doing their own thing and worshiping other gods. And as a result, God left them in the hands of the Midians to literally be plundered by them. Two tribes that uh, persecuted Israel a lot in those days, the Amalekites and the Midians, uh, Midianites rather, both of them were cousins of Israel. Uh, the Amalekites were the grandchildren of Esau, who was Jacob's brother. And then obviously the Midianites were also cousins because Abraham took another wife and, and he had uh, six kids with her. And, and, and Midianite, a Midian, who was the uh, father of the Midianites, was the fourth child. And so sometimes in life, the first lesson I need you to understand is some of the greatest pain that you may ever go through in life uh, is most more often than not inflicted by people that are closest to you. It is people that are closest to us that have the greatest potential to hurt us the most. And so you find that there are two different spirits that operated here. The Amalekites are the type of people that prey on the weak. The Amalekites are the type of people that find you at your weakest and kick you while you are down. I am praying that God will remove any Amalekite spirit out of your life. May God give you friends who will be there for you at your weakest. May God give you people that will lift you up and pick you up when you are feeling weak and not very strong. The Amalekite spirit doesn't do that. It doesn't encourage. It doesn't lift you up. Hey, Pastor Tosi, good to have you on the line, my friend. Uh, the Amalekite spirit doesn't encourage you to get back on your feet. It gossips about you. It tells everybody what you did wrong. Oh, guess what we heard? Oh, guess what we saw? That is the Amalekite spirit. And I'm rebuking it out of your life. If you have such a circle of friends, you need to divorce yourself from the Amalekite spirit. But in the Gideon story, in the Gideonite story, rather the story of Gideon here, you find that the, he was dealing with another tribe, another cousin, as a matter of fact, the Midianites. The Midianites were the type of people who they would sit back and wait for you to sow your seed, wait for you to work hard, wait for you to, to do all these things and then come and plunder your harvest. These were the Midianites. They did that. They worked for you to work. Some of you have been working hard for many years. You've been sowing seed. You've been going to church. You've been giving your tithe. You've been, you've been a good wife. You've been a good husband. You, you've been a good employee. You, you have been good. You've done your best. And yet you have not seen a harvest. Today I decree and declare that the spirit of the Midianites is being removed from off of your life. It has been uprooted right now. And now is the time for your harvest. So everything that you deserved while you have been sowing, the harvest that has been due to you is coming to you now because 
God is going to rebuke the devourer and he's going to make sure you receive that which you deserve. See, the Midianite spirit is one where you are doing things right, but you are not seeing a harvest. And so even when you're doing wrong, this grace covers you. But the whole point is the Midianite spirit steals your harvest. May God give you back everything that the locusts have stolen, the canker worm and, and the crushing worm and the chewing worm. May God replace back to you everything that you have lost. The time, the laughter, the joy, the finances, your health, the friends, the family. May God replace back to you everything that the enemy has stolen. Now look at this. Immediately what happens is, the man is scared. Gideon is hiding in the wine press, the Bible says. He's hiding in the wine press. And the angel of the Lord shows up and calls him mighty man of valor. Mighty man of valor. Here is a man uh, cowardly hiding somewhere, uh, trying to <laughs> crush wheat in a wine press. What a place to crush wheat. But God calls and calls him a man of valor. I'm going to quickly give you seven points uh, while I, I walk you through Gideon. And we'll be done in no time. These are seven valuable points. Number one one lesson from this is that your time of loss is over. Your time of loss is over. That means you will not lose anymore. You will not lose any more stuff. The devil will not steal any, any more of your things. If you have been miscarrying your babies, this is the last time you have a miscarriage. I put a stop to this under this anointing. You will not lose anymore. Now, the times that you have lost, may they be points of reference, points of learning. May you take the experience and become a better man. Take the experience, become a better woman, but you will not lose anymore. There is a standard that God is raising up over your life and the enemy will not be able to steal your harvest anymore. It is receiving time. The time has come for you to move into the overflow so you can be a blessing to somebody else. So remember that the Ruth chapter 2 and verse 12, you can put Ruth chapter 2 verse 12 against point number one. The time of loss is over. Jehovah Gemola, your recompense is coming to your house. Number two lesson we learned from the story of Gideon is that God, don't, you should not let fear paralyze you. So in other words, do not let fear paralyze you. Fear is both spiritual and physical. Fear is both spiritual and physical. The adrenaline that pumps is not a spiritual thing. It is it's a natural thing. It's a physical thing. But the power of God is going to come on you this week. You will not fear anymore. Now listen. Some of you might be there thinking, oh, but, but Gideon was scared. Oh, yes, I know. Notice what happens with Gideon. Gideon is scared, but he went anyway. Gideon was afraid, but he went anyway. That is the ultimate definition of the word courage. Courage is being able to be scared and be afraid, but you keep going. You do not quit. You keep going. What happened to the 22,000 that God removed from his army? They were scared and they went home. You see, when you quit after fear, you have already lost. When you quit after being afraid, you've already lost. You have no chance of recovery because you've already quit. But when you refuse, Refuse to quit, regardless of how scared you are. You trust God. You keep going. God can work with that. God is not looking for finished products. He's not looking for perfect vessels. He is looking for people that are willing to go, regardless of how they feel. That are willing to keep going, despite themselves. So don't let fear paralyze you. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 8. He himself has promised to never leave you. No forsake you. Number three, very quickly, we're moving through this. Number three, God calls you what you should be. I love this. God finds a man hiding in the wine press, scared, shaking, and yet he doesn't see his present state. He sees him as he should be. He sees Gideon in his future, a mighty man of courage, a mighty man of valor. Right now, you may be shaking in your boots. You don't even know what you're going to eat tomorrow. You might be timid. You might be scared. You might be shy. Whatever it is that the label people have given you because of where you are right now, God doesn't see you like that. God is God sees a champion. God sees a winner. God sees a fighter. God sees a prince. God sees a princess. God sees a queen in you. He sees a king in you. He sees a president, a CEO, a man of God, a woman of God. God sees a, a woman full of joy when you think you are depressed. God sees a, a courageous woman who's going to raise her kids. 
the right way. When you think you're a bad parent, God sees a woman who is the best wife around. When you think you're failing at your marriage, God sees you exactly how you should be, not how you are. This is how faith operates, ladies and gentlemen. 11, Hebrews 11 verse 1, the Bible says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not yet seen. And you see, in the book of Romans, the Bible says, God speaks those things that be not as though they were. I believe it's chapter 4 verse 17. He is the God who speaks those things that are not as though they were. So he looks at Gideon. Gideon looks scared. Gideon looks afraid. He is hiding away. But God doesn't call him as he is. He calls him as he ought to be. So that is the second, the, 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 I believe it's the third point. The third point is God calls you what you should be, not what you are. Here's the mistake we make most of us Christians. If you're sick in the body, you call it as it is. I am sick. This sickness is killing me. You are calling it as it is. And it only, it's only a matter of time before we come to your funeral. But what you need to do is you need to call what, what you want to happen. So you need to say, I know that I'm not well, but by his stripes, I'm already healed. By his stripes, I'm already healed. God sent his word and he healed my disease. I know that my husband is crazy, but thank God is going to straighten him out and he will not kill me. He will not send me to an early grave. He is a good man. He's going to straighten out and the Lord is working in him. You begin to speak those things that you want to see and it's only a matter of time before you are standing in your confession. So be like God. God calls you how you ought to be, not how you are. When you're messing up, he calls you the righteousness of God in Christ. When you think nobody loves you, God calls you the beloved of the Lord. When you think you are stranded, God says, I will open doors for you that no man can shut. So number four, let's move through this. Number four, we got a few more. We're doing seven today and then we're done. Number four, the Lord is your peace. In chapter six and verse 23 to 24, after Gideon has seen the hand of the Lord, he, he, op he, makes a, he creates an altar to the Lord and he introduces Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, my peace. And he calls that altar Jehovah Shalom. May God give you peace that surpasses all understanding. May God calm your heart. May God bring peace to your family. May God bring peace to your career. May God bring peace to your physical body. That means wholeness. That means healing. May God send people your way that will not stress you out and leave you exasperated, but will make you feel calm. And may God give you peace. Listen, there's a peace that surpasses all understanding. There's a peace that goes beyond any mental health issue you can ever go through. God is your eternal peace. And I am praying that he will give you total shalom, which means having nothing missing and nothing broken. Literally, the Zoe kind of life that God talks about through Jesus Christ, Yeshua, uh, Yehoshua, in, in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I can that they may have life in abundance. Number five, uh, the Bible says that he will save you with only a few. Uh, when Gideon uh, believed what God was going to do, he took an army to himself, 33,000 of them together. But God said, this is too many people. I'm going to make sure we reduce the number so that when I save Israel, Israel will know that God did this. There are certain things that you are going through in your life right now that God has allowed deliberately to be stripped of you. Some of you may have lost your job. Some of you may have lost your man or your woman. You, you've lost something significant that has probably even made you cry, but God is saying, listen, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. And in all these things, my glory shall be seen. Do not faint in the times of trouble, my friends. Do not faint in the, in the times of calamity. The same God on the mountain is the same God in the valley. This is why David was able to say in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because God is with me. Whether you are going through a good time, whether you're going through a tough time, God is still with you. God still cares. He still loves you and he still got your back. I promise you this. He is a good God. He's a faithful God and he will not leave you nor forsake you. So listen, God is going to save you not because of where you went to university or where you matriculated from. God is going to prosper you not because of whom you know. God is going to prosper you not because of what you have. It is not about the natural advantage. We are Christians. We don't just move by what we feel nor by what we see. We walk 
of by faith. And so I want you to begin to know that every time you hear a word like this and you say, yeah, that's it. I'm coming out. I'm going to the top. Stop counting what you can do physically in the natural. See, our weapons are not carnal. They are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And we have a God who exists outside of our time and outside of our realm. He's a supernatural God. And he says to you, I'm going to save you despite yourself. I'm going to prosper you despite your network. I know your network is your net worth. But if you add your net uh, praise and the angels to your network, my goodness me, there is no limit to what God can do for you. Number five, we are saying that he will save you with a few. That's number five. So number six, untested faith. Look at this. Number six, we got two more. Number six, untested faith becomes smaller and weaker. I'm going to pause for a moment just for effect. Christians, myself included, we are the only people that go to God and ask God to show us his power, to show us the supernatural, to do a miracle for us, and to move in the most amazing way. And then in the next breath, we pray that God will make sure we don't go through anything in life that involves us using our faith. That involves God coming through to save us. That involves us experiencing a miracle. So in other words, we pray for God to do a miracle in our lives and to move in our lives and to do amazing things. But we don't want to go through anything in life that requires a miracle. It is a direct contradiction. But I am praying for you. Listen, whatever you are going through, God is not the source or the author of your trouble. But he is your defender. He is your warrior, mighty man of war. He is your protector. He is your savior. Your your redeemer and he will come through for you but just because you go through trouble doesn't mean god is not there doesn't mean he doesn't care doesn't mean he's left you alone may he be the fourth man in your fire may god cause the lions in your den to become vegetarian they don't have appetite for you i know that trouble will come but jesus says listen john 16 33 trouble will come in this world but be of good cheer I have overcome the world. And so number six, I need you to understand that your faith is going to be tested sometimes. It, it increases your faith muscle. When you overcome some things, your faith muscle grows. When you overcome some, some things, your, your trust in God grows because God sees you through this thing. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 7 to 9 talks about it. Trials will come to test your faith. Make sure when they come, you are standing on the word of God. Show me a man or woman who has never gone through any challenges and I will show you a man or woman who is dead. D-E-A-D. You are not alive. If you have no problems, no challenges, no bills, nothing, nobody's talking ugly about you. Either you are dead or you are just the most irrelevant human being on this planet. Listen, people will talk about you. People will even hate you. People will uh, try to crush you. But I need you to remember, they that are with you are more than they that are in the world. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm going to give you the last one. Number seven. This is the most powerful one. If you do this, your life will never be the same again. See, I already told you our weapons are not carnal. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 to 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Look what, what Gideon did. After God trimmed the number from 33,000 to 300, Gideon and the 300 soldiers did not pick up machine guns or AK-47s. They did not pick up machetes. They picked up their instruments of praise, their instruments of worship. Look at this. They are about to face an army. And they begin to praise God. You see, the devil can take a lot of things away from you, but there is something he can never take away from you, and that is your ability to praise God. The enemy will never be able to take away the ability for you to worship God. There is no greater weapon in your arsenal than your praise. Your praise is your way out of jail. Your praise is your way out of poverty. Your praise is your, I know that you need to give seed, and you need to pray, and you need to read the Bible, and all these things, but there is nothing that opens the prison gates more powerful powerfully and more quickly than your praise. So they began to praise God. And when they began to praise God, number seven, which is what we are calling God, will confuse your enemies. I've written all seven of them in the post. If you look at the top of the video, number seven, God will confuse your enemies. And here is how God is going to confuse your enemies. When the devil expects you to be crying and feeling sorry for yourself, you begin to praise God. When he's expecting you to be depressed, you put on a dance. Hallelujah. 
This is how you confuse your enemies, both the physical human enemies and the demonic enemies. They find you praising God. Not only do they get confused because you are doing what they expect you not to be doing, but something breaks in the spiritual realm when you praise God, when you worship God. There is something more powerful about your praise and your worship than even your prayer requests of what you actually need and want from God. And so I'm encouraging you wherever you are watching me from right now. Friends, family, I know you guys are joining me from, from Kenya, Zambia, the United States, the UK, I can see you guys, and South Africa, and, and everywhere that you're joining me from. Listen, God loves you too much to leave you stranded. He loves you too much. As a matter of fact, when you win, he takes the glory. So he's interested in your victory. He's invested in your victory. Your victory doesn't just bring glory to you. It brings glory to his name. So he wants you to win. And so I want to encourage you. God will confuse your enemies. But that's only going to happen when you develop a grateful heart. When you develop a, a, a faith that makes you praise God before you see the miracle. A faith that makes you begin to thank God before you see the breakthrough. I'm going to leave you guys at that or with that. Listen, love you all, but remember seven things. Number one, your time of loss is over. Number two, don't let fear paralyze you. Number three, God calls you as you should be, and you need to begin to see yourself like that. Gideon couldn't see himself like that. God had to take him to the enemy's camp so he can hear the gossip, what people were saying about him. Some of you, if only you knew what the devil thought about you, you wouldn't live the way you do. You are a giant. You are powerful. You are dangerous. And the enemy is scared of you. That's why he's after your children. That's why he's after your job. That's why he's after your mind. That is why he's after everything that you are believing God for your family, your relationships, because you are dangerous. You are a threat and he's scared of you. And number four, we said God is your peace. And number five, we said he will save you with only a few. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Number six, untested faith gets smaller and weaker. So rejoice when you are talking about ugly. Rejoice when you go through trouble because your faith is just getting stronger and better and God is preparing you for even better things. And finally, God will confuse your enemies. And as I finish today, I decree and I declare that your enemies are getting confused right now. I decree and I declare confusion in the enemy's camp on your behalf right now. Confusion, confusion. Where they were planning to fire you and sideline you, may they be confused and fire themselves. And may they be confused and only do damage to their own camp. Where they were planning to steal from you, may they be confused and return your money. And whoever owns, owes you anything, may God be your recompense. Where they were confused, where they were planning to, to kill you early, may confusion go into that camp and they will bless you instead of cursing you. They will say good things about you instead of what they were planning. They will set you up for your promotion instead of firing you because God is getting ready to fight for you. Put on your praise. Put on your worship. I love you guys and I'll see you next Sunday. I know that uh, you guys have been joining me from everywhere. There's so many names. I I, uh, I can see you guys here. Just uh, noted some of you. Peggy, Perry, good to see you. Of course, my friend, Pastor Tosi and Mom Flora, Irene, good to see you. John, hey, good to see you online. Uh, let me see what we got here. Sherry Ann, good to see you online. Amy, it's good to have you on the line. And uh, Kesego, good to see you on the line. And, and Mwaba Chin to my friend, good to see you on the line. Praise God. Hallelujah. Elizabeth, my sister, I know you're always there. Good to see you. And then Elizabeth, Ladla, my friend, prophetess, hey, God bless you. Good to see you on the line. Messy, good to see you on the line. Listen, if I haven't seen your name here because so many of them are flashed, that's all right. Still love you. Melon, love you. And Maps, love you. Hey, love you so much, guys. And I appreciate your uh, support all the time and, and just your partnership. We win together. We don't win in isolation. We win 
together. I will put this on the uh, watch something that Facebook have put on. For those of you that have missed it, you can watch it in the watch party. But take the lessons in this and may God bless you. And yes, I will see you soon. That's right. And I'm uh, looking forward to having you back in the UK, Pastor Tosi. We can't wait for, uh, for you to come back. God bless you. And I'll see you guys soon. Ciao for now. Ciao, ciao.